Welcome in to the On3 Studios here in Nashville, Tennessee. It's Thursday morning, another wild week of recruiting. We had some big junior days last weekend, expecting some more of that across the country this weekend. And remember, final open recruiting weekend before we enter another dead period. So Sunday night, it goes dead. But, you know, the dead period... It's not all that dead. It's a great name, though. I love it. It sounds like complete silence, right? It's not. Here's a quote I found on the NCSA website that describes a dead period pretty well. While the term dead period makes it seem like all recruiting stops during this time, that's actually not the case. Athletes and coaches are still allowed to communicate via phone, email, social media, and other digital communication channels. So... Contact is still very much allowed, just not face-to-face. -face. Basically, no on-campus visits, no camps, no junior days, no nothing. You can't meet with the staff face-to-face -face on campus, and they can't set anything up for you if you choose to go on your own dime. So the dead period will begin, like I said, February 4th, Sunday night, it's, it's dead. So February 5th is actually the first day, and it runs through March 3rd. So basically, it, the coaches get an entire month off, well-deserved after all this craziness leading up to signing day. Okay, speaking of signing day, let's take a look at what remains between now and Wednesday, February 7, National Signing Day. Here's who we're watching. Five-star athlete Terry Bussey, wide receiver Gatlin Bear, edge Amari Williams, defensive lineman Dimitri Nicholas, and edge Kiona Wilhite. We'll start with five-star athlete Terry Bussey. Last weekend, you know, he's committed to Texas A&M. But last weekend, he took that official visit to Georgia. He's the number one athlete in America. It was his first visit to Georgia in the past year or so. So at the, this point right now, I think UGA is kind of on the outside looking in, but they are looking for some late momentum. But then Terry Bussey this week, just yesterday, he took a visit to LSU, kind of a surprise stop in Baton Rouge. He's already taken an official visit there, so it was on his own dime. He's committed to AM, like I said, and will be there for his official visit this weekend. But where hit will he sign on National Signing Day? That's what I want to know. And I want to know what you guys think. Will he stick or will he flip? Let me know. Comment section below. All right. Wide receiver Gatlin Bear, the number 30 overall prospect. I did a video on him yesterday. You can check that out on our feed. Now, he had been trending heavily to Michigan. Of course, Jim Harbaugh leaves. Dan Lanning announces he's staying. So now... Gatlin Bear is trending towards the Ducks at 88%. We saw picks from Justin Hopkins, EJ Holland uh, two nights ago. Steve Wiltfong dropped a big crystal ball pick in for him. Now, Bear decommitted from Boise State a couple months ago after coaching change. And I think at this point, he's looking for stability. And you can find that in Oregon with Dan Lanning and the Ducks. All right. Up next, Edge Amari Williams. He was an elite 2025 prospect who opted to reclassify to 2024. Sounds a lot like Ryan Williams, huh? Yes, it does. No relation, though. Now, he immediately, in December, after the reclassification, took a visit to Florida State right after announcing that he would be a 2024 prospect. That's the only official visit he ended up taking. Now, during the season, he did visit UF, Kentucky, Penn State, uh, USC as well, but it looks right now like he is trending heavily to FSU. And at this point, I think he will be a null on signing day. But wait, let's see what happens this weekend. Does he show up anywhere surprising? I don't anticipate it. I think he will sign with FSU next Wednesday. All right. We're also talking about defensive lineman Dimitri Nicholas out of Miami Central. He's 6'3", 295, one of the top interior defensive linemen that's available. Now, his RPM shows that he's trending at 80%. But I don't expect him to land at Auburn. I think they are going to use that spot for a transfer portal position. I don't think they're going to use it at the high school level. So look for Michigan State to come into the Sunshine State and land Nicholas on National Signing Day. All right, the last prospect that we are keeping an eye on is Edge Keona Wilhite. He's from Arizona, and it's down to three schools. It's UCLA, Nebraska, and Michigan State. He'll make his decision on signing day, trending right now at 82% to UCLA. Let me know, comment section, where do you guys think they're going? Let me know. All right, great show planned today. I talked with Andy Staples about the latest fight that the NCAA is picking with Tennessee and how that's going to impact recruiting, not just recruiting at Tennessee, but just recruiting in general. We're also going to talk some junior day action out in Oregon, and we'll take a look at who won the state of Florida this cycle, which team recruited the Sunshine State the best. I break it all down. All right, big show. Let's go.
Did the NCAA pick a fight with Tennessee that they cannot win? And how does this impact recruiting? We're going to break it down in this video. I got on threes, Andy Staples. We're going to talk all about the latest developments in the NCAA versus Tennessee. We're also going to hit on the investigations taking place in Gainesville and the resolution FSU came to in their case. So do me a favor right now, hit subscribe. I got to thank you guys for getting this page to 40K in under six months. This page started at the end of August. So let's make the next move. Let's get it to 50K, hit subscribe. All right, let's bring in college football analyst Andy Staples. And recruiting and NIL are intertwined. So I thought it was appropriate, Andy, that I bring you on today to talk about this latest drama that's unfolding literally by the minute between Tennessee and the NCAA. And it looked like the first go around with Tennessee and the NCAA infractions committee when Jeremy Pruitt was there, they were very much open and willing to work with the <laughs> NCAA. Not so much this time around, huh? It's amazing how much more willing you are to cooperate when you would like them to hammer your coach so you can fire him for cause and, and save yourself a $13 million buyout. It's, it's funny how that works, but yeah, this is a very different situation for Tennessee and, and now Tennessee potentially faces repeat violator status, but also yeah. it's not just about Tennessee. Like Tennessee's the one they went after, but there's a lot of schools that they could have gone after and, and there are a lot of schools they are investigating. I mean, there, there are more cases in the pipeline right now. And I think the problem is, and, and Tennessee is looking at this, and I bet we'll see other schools looking at this. And there, there's a reason Virginia's attorney general jumped in on this thing too. And I think you may see some other states jump in. It could be your school next because what they are going after is essentially what is now standard practice in college football. So like, if you want to sign a good football or basketball player, you have to do all of the things mm -hmm. that the NCAA is now trying to say you can't do. So, yeah, so that leads me to my next question. Is this a bigger problem for the schools or is this a bigger problem right now for the NCAA? It's a bigger problem for the NCAA because they cannot attack these particular schools. Like this is the wrong group to pick a fight with because they don't need the NCAA. They could go form something else or they could rally the other schools to just reorganize within, within the NCAA and change the model. And they're gonna have to change it anyway. That's, that's the thing that I just don't understand why they're even bothering with this right now it's it, i guess they're trying to flex a little bit and say hey we're still in charge but they're clearly not still in charge like they're going to lose this case and then it's kind of all the stuff that you were worried about you don't have to worry about it anymore because the rules won't be in effect because they will be they'll, they'll have been deemed illegal well, they, they came at Florida State about a month ago. You know, the NCAA kind mm -hmm. of pushed FSU into corner, accusing FSU offensive coordinator Alex Atkins of driving a, a Marius Mims to meet with the NIL collective. Uh, they came, they charged them they, with allegations in Florida State. I mean, Andy, did Florida State fold here? Because they took a much different approach than Tennessee is taking right now. Florida State's busy fighting on another front right now, yeah. Josh. They're, they're suing the ACC, that so I, I don't know. I don't know how many many legal resources they have for this one. But I also think this this one was such. It was so small time. Like I imagine they did not expect the penalty to be this high. But this was a kind of negotiated thing. I know they wanted to get it out of the way. Uh, they were about to give Mike Norvell a big raise. Whether that was to keep him from going to Alabama or just to reward him, meh, we'll we'll see. Right. We'll see when the or both. Know, as the as the truth right or both as the truth <laughs> trickles out about the Alabama coaching search and and we you know separate fact from fiction, but it allowed them to wrap all this up. Now I think what they the three game suspension for Alex Atkins was extraordinarily harsh for mm -hmm. what we're talking about here, especially since it's something that the NCAA president just said last month he thinks schools should be handling anyway. Like it, it's. It's mystifying to me that when you've already said, hey, we're going to back off this stuff anyway, we're going to abandon it anyway. Why are you bothering to try to enforce it now? Right. Yeah, it's kind of weird. And, and we're also let's just stay in the state of Florida. We'll go to Gainesville. The NCAA is investigating the Gators for the Jaden Rashada recruitment. So, I, I mean, what's next for recruiting, Andy? Do these latest investigations kind of change the way that teams might uh, approach recruiting top players i mean is it going to change the game well not if the court i mean it's going to change the game if the court grants the temporary restraining order or an injunction which it, it probably will and that'll mean that you can just discuss nil stuff with recruits and you don't have to worry about getting punished for it because it's mm. just 
going to be okay because the, the rule against it will have been declared illegal. So that's that's the deal right now. The, the Florida one's interesting because I always thought that the Rashada thing was kind of low hanging fruit for them. And it was a little bit different case because it was such an extraordinary number. It never actually got paid out exactly. and it was just kind of clums, clumsily written. But, you know, the thing about this is like the Tennessee case is, is Nico Yama Melava. Like that contract that Nico did with Spire Sports, which is the collective with Tennessee, like everybody else kind of modeled what they do on that model. Exactly. And so if you are if you are a big time school in either football or basketball, you're doing this. Like you are doing exactly what Tennessee is being investigated for. And so you're probably going, uh oh, if this is allowed to stand, I could be next. And I don't think any of the schools actually want that. So they're either going to fight with Tennessee or they're going to let let Tennessee and some and some other folks slug it out and hope that they win. Because I, I just think ultimately they're going to have to design another model because you can't you can't prosecute everybody for doing the thing that is now the industry standard. It's not it's bad for business. Yeah. Is this kind of a slow trickle? What I mean is when you saw Florida State kind of get prosecuted for this in December, early January, there wasn't a big outcry. Then you heard about Florida and people were kind of scratching their heads. And now it's Tennessee. And now it seems like it's college football versus the NCAA. It's not even like Tennessee versus the NCAA. It's like college right. football versus the NCAA right now. And is that because, like you said, teams feel like, hey, we could be next for this? Well, yeah, because what what they did with Nico is what everybody copied. So everybody's doing it, and or already you know, did. That, that's the thing. And and I want to point out because yeah. people keep asking me this, and it's a really good question. Didn't the schools make the rules? Yes, the schools do make the rules in the NCAA. Yes, they can change them. But the problem is with NIL, especially because it's been such a moving target and it's everything's changed so fast. They've not really made the rules through the traditional channels. It's all been done kind of ad hoc through through certain committees, and it's not exactly been a representative democracy in this sort of thing. So <laughs> there are schools that probably feel like the rules don't represent how they feel, and it may be that the rules don't represent a majority of how the power conference schools feel. And if they don't, then they're going to change them. All right. Well, this stuff is moving fast. It's developing as we speak, and we'll see. The NCAA, they might have picked a fight. They can't win. Andy Staples, thanks for stopping by the Inside Scoop today. Thanks, Josh. Oregon is not done when it comes to the 2024 recruiting class. Most of the country, though, is finished. But Oregon, they are trending for a top 50 wide receiver. His name's Gatlin Bear. And I got Justin Hopkins from Scoop Duck on this video. We're going to find out if it's going to be Michigan or Oregon for Bear. Also, Dan Lanning getting a jump on 2025 recruiting. He had a couple of elite recruits on campus last weekend. We're going to talk about them too. But first, Oregon fans, look at this. Less than six months with this page, and it's already over 40K. I thank you, but let's get this thing to 50K. Hit subscribe for me. All right, let's bring on Justin Hopkins from Scoop Duck, and we'll talk about the big names on campus, starting with Fahim Delaney, the number two safety in America. Uh, what's the relationship with Fahim Delaney? Because he came in from across the country over in Maryland. Yeah, that's a guy that, uh, you know, safety defensive back coach Chris Hampton has been working for a while already. And, you know, this is not his first trip to Oregon, uh, but it was a very successful trip. The Ducks ultimately laid out the red carpet, as you would expect, all that. But the feeling is uh, coming out of this trip that they feel like they're certainly, you know, cemented really strongly in that top two, top three position, which is a great spot to be in. Um, nobody expects him to make an immediate decision. This is probably a recruitment that will go on for months and months. Uh, so for now, Oregon has done a great job getting on that short list and positioning themselves to get him back on campus this spring as well. All right. Now we'll talk about De'Aire Hill. He's out of Belleville, Illinois, so another, another long-distance trip over to campus, number 88 overall, and he's the sixth-best athlete in America. Uh, Justin, where does Oregon like De'Aire Hill? Where does he fit in? Offense, defense. Yeah, this is a guy that uh, running back coach Carlos Lachlan has been prioritizing, and he did talk about the relationship there and the fact that the Ducks do like him on offense, which I think is a great fit for his skill set. Um, he's just a really complete back and a guy that Oregon has prioritized. And I would say if we're looking at Oregon's running back big board, Hill's probably at least 
number two on that list. Jordan Davidson's another one that the Ducks are pushing hard for. Uh, those are a couple of the guys early, but they did great. Talk to Hill, loved the visit. Um, one of these things that, that has resonated, as it did with Hill, was just uh, what we've talked about with Dan Lanning sticking to his roots in Oregon and the grass being damn green in Eugene. Uh, and that's really resonating with recruits and definitely did with Hill as well. Okay, now we'll talk about Achilles Smith here in a second, but Justin Hill, no relation to De'Aire Hill, he was on campus. He's from Cincinnati, Ohio. Seems to be a pretty big priority. Where do you put him on that edge defensive line board right now for Oregon? Yeah, this is definitely a priority. Dan Lanning did take time out of his last couple of weeks to visit Hill, which you know mm -hmm. means there's a lot of interest there on, on Oregon's part at least. Uh, that was reciprocated, of course, with Hill coming to visit Oregon on his own dime, so that's big. I would say this is probably a top two or three guy on the edge board for Oregon. Yeah. Um, you know, distance, they won't let that be a factor, but let's let's be real. Ohio State's going to be very, very diligent not letting this guy get out of their home state. So we'll see how this battle shapes up, but it looks like that might be the early battle right now, Oregon and Ohio State. Yeah, big, big visit to get him on campus this early in the cycle. Uh, all right, so let's circle back to Achilles Smith. Uh, he's committed to Oregon. I actually put in the first prediction for Achilles Smith to land at Oregon. Now, he's from California, and he made it in. How much of a help is it to have a quarterback like this that's a recognizable name on campus for big junior day events like this? Yeah, I think you talk to any coach in America, and if they're speaking bluntly, that's a huge recruiting mm -hmm. tool. A guy like Akili Smith, highly ranked. He's obviously going to work on the offensive guys, but just having him committed uh, gives a lot of strength to the program. Not to mention his dad, obviously a legacy. Mm -hmm. his, a lot of history made at Oregon, went to the NFL. You know, he was on campus as well with him, so you have him around. So kind of a double dip and, and just a really another – very strong recruiting tool for any school, but in this case with Akili Smith in Oregon, just great to have him around and be around those guys that Oregon is definitely prioritizing early on. All right, now to the battle that has been brewing for the last couple months over Gatlin Bear. When he decommitted from Boise State a couple months ago, it was Oregon and it was Michigan, and he's the number 30 player overall, and there's really not many players available, so this recruitment, it only intensifies because of that. And for a long time, Justin, he was trending to Michigan, right? Then Dan Lanning announces he's staying. Jim Harbaugh announces he's leaving. And now Oregon on the recruiting prediction machine is trending at 88%. You put a pick in yesterday. EJ Holland put a pick in yesterday. Steve Wiltfong put a pick in yesterday. What is going on? Is it just a matter of time before Gatlin Bear commits to Oregon? Feels like it. You know, obviously we're approaching the original signing day, which is yeah. no longer uh, the, the headliner. But uh, prior to the early signing day, I, I thought uh, if Bear – did not delay his commitment into this period. I was about to put a prediction in for Michigan, and okay. then Oregon was able to do that. That was the key, was getting him to hang on and not put that prediction in. And as you can see, the result of that is Harbaugh going to the NFL. Probably a great decision by him, but that opened the door for Oregon, and I think that was just kind of the last you know, shoot a drop, if you will, in his recruitment. So, yeah, a month ago, this was all Michigan's to lose, but with the changes and, and, and everything that's happened in that month, this one feels very strongly in favor of Oregon right now. So can anything change between now and next Wednesday? I mean, does Michigan have an in-home visit left? Do you think he goes anywhere this weekend? I mean, how we're down to the final six or seven days. Yeah, I don't think he's going anywhere this weekend. I think he'll just lay low with his family and probably, you know, think this thing out. Uh, I don't know how Michigan's in-home visits are set up because of Harbaugh leaving. Do they have another one? they can use under Sharon Moore, who's not right. yet the head coach as we know. So I don't know how that'll work for Michigan, but uh, you know, as far as that goes, I think I expect it'll be fairly quiet under for the bear camp. And I don't know that he'll commit on the signing day per se, but we'll probably hear something early next week. If not. All right. Well, Gatlin bear, the number 30 overall ranked player in America is now trending to Oregon and partially because of Justin Hopkins. So Justin, thank you for stopping by the inside scoop and talking a little Oregon recruiting today. Yes, sir. Thanks, Josh.
What team signed the best players in the state of Florida? In this video, we're going to take a look at the 10 best recruits and figure out who landed the best talent in the Sunshine State in 2024. But first, I want to say thank you. We are over 40K in less than six months of starting this page. Yes, we started in August. We're already over 40K, so let's get it to 50K. Hit subscribe for me, please. All right. The state of Florida puts out some of the best talent each year. It's the reason that every team in America comes to the state of Florida to find talent. But who made out with the best players in the state this year? That's what we're going to break down. Well, we know Ohio State got one, right? They got the number one overall player in Jeremiah Smith. But that was the only one that the Buckeyes landed in the top 10 here. Let's take a look right now at the top 10 players in the state of Florida and where they landed. Quick note, we took the IMG Academy recruits that were not born in Florida out. So guys like Ellis Robinson from Connecticut or Jordan Seaton from Maryland are not a part of this list. You see Jeremiah Smith there at number one. Defensive lineman LJ McCray, he goes to UF. Clemson drop, jumps into the top three and nabs TJ Moore. Bama gets Zay Mincy. Armando Blunt flips from Florida State to Miami late. Then Miami goes on a run. They get JoJo Trader there at number six. Charles Lester goes to FSU at seven. Miles Graham to UF. Booker Pickett and Zaquan Patterson round out the top 10. Now, like I said, Ohio State, yes, they did get the number one recruit in the state, but that's it for the Buckeyes, even in the top 25 of the state of Florida. So let's see. If you're coming into the state and you land Jeremiah Smith, but he's the only one you land in the top 25, that's still a big win for the Buckeyes. Like I said, Clemson jumps into the into the five. Uh, Bama, they get Zay Mincy. But it's clear when you look at just the 10 top players in the state of Florida that this is a battle between the three top teams in the state of Florida, UF, FSU, and Miami, the big three. They are battling it out for who is the best recruiting program in the state. Now, let's break down this top 10 a little bit further. UF, they signed two in LJ McCray and Miles Graham. Florida State in the top 10 signed one in Charles Lester. Miami, they signed four in the top 10, only one in the top five. That was Armando Blunt. So I'm starting to feel like Miami is that team. I think they might have won the state in 2024. What do you guys think? Let me know. Comment section below. But we got to dig a little deeper. Maybe, just maybe, we need to look at a little bit bigger cross-section of the state to figure this out. Let's take a look at how the big three schools did at recruiting in the top 25, not just the top 10. Here, outside the top 25, the rest of Florida. All right, this is how Florida State did outside the top 10. They land Jamari Howard at 11, Kai Bates at 13, LeWayne McCoy, wide receiver at 22, Makai Danzi, number 23 in the state, and Jonathan Daniels, 25 in the state. So... Florida State, they kind of get a haul. They land a haul outside of the top 10. Not, not necessarily as much as Miami landed inside, but outside, they did pretty good. Miami, though, they also got a couple players outside the top 10. Jordan Lyle, who they flipped from Ohio State at number 14. Chance Robinson, number 18. Adarius Hayes, number 19. All right, so we got to keep going. Florida, they only, outside of the top 10, they only landed one. They, they get Jameer Grimsley, who was an early signee with Alabama, but ends up leaving after Nick Saban retires and is ultimately a Florida Gator. So the top 25, UF signed three, one of them being the number two player overall, LJ McCray in the state. FSU signed six in the top 25, but then you got Miami, who not only signed the most in the top 10, but also in the most in the top 25, they signed seven. So I did some science in my head. And it looks like I got Miami, Miami. That's my top class in the state of Florida with FSU close behind. Florida, they landed a few good ones, but I get them third in the state this cycle. You guys, tell me what you think. Does Mario Cristobal land the best group in Florida? Or do you think it was Mike Norvell or Billy Napier? You guys let me know. Comment section below which team recruited the state of Florida the best. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that content, be sure to subscribe to the On3 Recruits channel. We have a new page dedicated only to recruiting. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button right now.